Hello, viewers of D3TV. My name is Wade Hazel. I'm a biology professor at DePauw, and I'm here to give my last lecture. My last lecture. Last lecture. Last lecture. My last lecture. There's some irony in the fact that I'm giving a last lecture and that I never really gave lectures in the traditional sense in the first place, and I actively rejected them altogether about 10 years ago. I never wanted to be an authority figure. I just loved the books that I loved and the characters that I met and the way that they challenged me to think about life. My experiences with all of you have taught me again and again and again that we are fellow travelers, figuring out together what this all means. It has been the best job in the world to be able to seek out meaning with all of you. So it's from that vantage point that I say this to you. I see you. I see the enormous pressure that our bizarre education system has placed on you from the first day of kindergarten on for you to learn what others tell you you need to learn, to show that you've learned it in prescribed ways, to adhere to a definition of success that none of us had a part in creating. It is a horrible thing that we have collectively put this kind of pressure on you because this pressure comes with a message that you have to be something different from who you are. And even in the midst of all this pressure, you shine your extraordinary light and cheerfully find new and thoroughly creative ways to change the world. You are an inspiration, and I am so grateful to have had the chance to cross paths with so many extraordinary people throughout the years. It's because of you, because of the courage that I see all of you manifesting in the paths that you chart out, that I made the decision to take early retirement so that I can pursue full-time the work that I've been doing to transform education. If you've ever visited my office, you've seen pictures of Nietzsche and Kafka looming over my desk. So much of what I care about comes from them. There's this great parable of Kafka's that goes like this. Alas, said the mouse, the whole world is growing smaller every day. At the beginning, it was so big that I was afraid and I kept running and running and I was glad when I saw walls far away to the right and left. But these long walls have narrowed so quickly that I'm in the last chamber already and there in the corner stands the trap that I must run into. You only need to change your direction, said the cat and ate it up. Some dark humor, right? The mouse figuring it all out right before he dies and he can't do anything with the information. It's pretty typical of Kafka and it's why I love him so much. But I carry it around with me as a reminder that in those moments that I feel most powerless, those moments when the world seems to be making all of my decisions for me, I just need to remember to change direction. In this very strange time we're all living in, it seems more important than ever to remember this. Just change direction, guys. We all have the power to do that. For Nietzsche, my other main man, it's about harnessing that power to become who you are, to make every choice a conscious choice and to view every necessity through the lens of your own power to direct the outcome. So here's what I want to say to you. In all things, become who you are and be open to who you are not yet. What I want to tell you is that your stories matter, your fears, hopes, dreams, internal monologues matter. They all matter. And keeping these things close to you as you pursue whatever path you pursue will make that path all the richer. It has been the greatest privilege to travel with you, to learn alongside of you. And I hope and I know that our paths will cross again. My name is David Worthington, and I am now an Emeritus Professor of Communication and Theater. This is my last lecture. I gave my first lecture at a community college in 1985. I was asked to come in to speak to a class and for an hour, and I did. I went in with my notes that were set for 50 minutes and uh, looked up at the students, looked down at my notes, and delivered the lecture. I delivered the 50-minute lecture in 20 minutes. And when I finally looked back up at the students, um, I asked if there were questions because somehow I needed to figure out a way to fill the next 30 minutes. And one woman raised her hand at the back of the room. This was a community college. They were non-traditional students, many of them. And this woman was older than I was. But she looked up and she looked at me and she said in a kind of halting voice, how old are you? It's not a question I get anymore. The gray has its story. But I've been fortunate to spend my career studying rhetoric. It's the study of language has been really important to me. And rhetoric is, of course, managing situations, particularly public ones. It's how we make judgments, how we choose this candidate over that candidate, how we opt for one idea over another idea, and how we talk ourselves into that. We look at audience, we look at friends and families, the people we work with, the people we work for, the people soon who will work for you. And of course, how we exist in our political and cultural lives. But language is based upon how we think. But how we think is also based in the language that we use. One of my mentors used to say that um, 
he had spent his whole career looking at how we talk ourselves into war. And what he meant by that was, we have to create an enemy, we have to talk about an enemy before we ever fire a bullet, before we ever dispatch troops. So as I leave DePauw, my last DePauw lecture, is spent urging you to think about the way that you use language. How do you talk about other people, about ideas, about things, and especially how do you talk about those individuals who are different from you? Do you work to make the world a better place? Do you work to find ways to be better and to make things around you better? Name calling, mocking, and insults are easy. It takes no real intellect to insult somebody. We start that when we're in kindergarten. But bridging divides takes work. It takes hard work. It's what can make your generation, doing that hard work is what can make your generation better than those that preceded you. Good luck. Thank you for making DePauw a challenging and special place. I look forward to seeing how you change the world. Hi, I'm Pascal Lafonton. I'm a professor of biology uh, at DePauw. And I was asked to do a three minutes last lecture. Now, my lecture could not or would not be about science. Uh, it is more about some of my belief that could be useful. Uh, I don't think I have wisdom on my own, so I have tried to follow the wisdom of others. There are a few quotes uh, that are important, have always been important to me in my life and career. And then of those quotes, I'm going to share three with you. Those quotes kind of uh, speak to two things, uh, perseverance and generosity. Um, those are two tenets, I think, in my life, in my teaching that I try to follow. To get to where you want to go, you really have to persevere because the road is never flat. Uh, you got to get used to it. You have to get used to fail. Uh, the scientific, scientific uh, correlate to that would be going into experiment knowing that at least eight out of ten times you're going to fail. But you need to be able to move on and continue in the face of those failures. Okay. Generosity kind of speaks for itself in some ways. So the first quote is the following. Courage does not, does not always war. Sometimes courage is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. I will try again tomorrow. And if you do, ultimately you will be able to succeed. The second one is by one of the authors that I like a lot, uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Uh, you might be familiar with the little novel, Le Petit Prince or The Little Prince, and this quote comes from it. On ne voit bien qu'avec le cœur, l'essentiel est invisible pour les yeux. Which tells us to really respond to the world, uh, what's happening to us with our heart, uh, understanding, uh, compassion, because really what's essential in life, you, it's not really obvious. It's usually not the thing you can just see with your eyes. Uh, so the translation is, it is only with the heart that one can see is clearly uh, what's essential is invisible to the eye. You'll find other translation, but that's the one that I prefer, at least that, I, that I've done. And finally, uh, the quote of, uh, uh, of St. Augustine, uh, there's many variations of it. But it starts as follow. Les temps sont mauvais, as a question. Soyons bons et le temps, et les temps seront bons, car nous sommes le temps. So it translates roughly, times are bad, question mark. Let's be good, and times will be good, because we are time. So this tells us that a lot of the change that needs to happen in the world really start with us. Uh, behave well. Be kind to others and then wait and see. You might not get the kindness immediately, but the world overall will be able to experience that kindness. So today, like a lot of you do, you wear your mask because of the pandemic. This is your way for you to be good, just to be good.
So this end my three, maybe more than three minutes uh, last lecture. Uh, good luck to all and keep in touch. Traditionally, in a last lecture, faculty share advice and wisdom with students. I've never claimed to be wise or to give good advice, so I'll leave it up to you, the viewer, to determine whether anything I share in the next few minutes is in any way worthy. So let's get started. Here, in no particular order, are 10 insights that I found helpful in guiding me in my life's journey. One, surround yourself with people smarter and better than you. I'm honored to have been part of the DePauw community for 22 years. My colleagues are smarter, more eloquent, and more dedicated to social justice than I. And I have grown so much because they continually challenge me to be a better version of myself. Two, walk, ride a bike, or take public transportation wherever and whenever you're able. Drive only when absolutely necessary and learn to drive a stick. Three, choose good role models. My role models include my father who, when supporting a family of seven, was essentially fired from his teaching position because he refused to sign a statement condemning evolution. And my mother, who became much more tolerant and accepting of others after living in Pakistan for a year. And San Romero, who, as Archbishop of San Salvador, advocated for the marginalized and vulnerable and was assassinated because of his words and actions. Four. Never let fungus get the upper hand. Enough said. Five, when you have a septic system, the only materials that should be flushed down the toilet are pee, poop, and paper. Anything else will eventually make your home life quite challenging, difficult, and expensive. Six, when you become aware of an issue, take action. Don't just wait around for others to address the problem. These actions can be simple, such as picking up litter while walking around campus, or more difficult, such as supporting survivors of sexual assault or advocating for marginalized and vulnerable communities. Seven, when you make a mistake or fall short, admit it, take responsibility, and move on. I continually mess up and spend much time and energy correcting my mistakes and healing relationships I've strained. Eight, develop and maintain a sense of humor. My family, friends, colleagues, and students are painfully aware of my affinity for dad jokes. Nine, cherish family and friends and treasure stories and memories. I am so fortunate to have a wonderful wife, five children, three sons-in-law, four grandchildren, and four siblings. I am grateful for their love and support and am continually amazed that they tolerate my quirks, my sense of humor, and my harebrained ideas. 10. If a survivor of sexual assault chooses to share their story, listen without judgment, believe them, ask if they're okay, thank them for sharing, connect them to resources if they need this, and support them in every way you can. Finally, my hope is that each of you seek your passion and calling, strive to make the world more just and equitable for everyone, advocate for the underserved, be in solidarity with the marginalized and vulnerable, and be at peace with yourself. It's been an honor and privilege to be part of the DePauw, Greencastle, and Putnam County communities, and I wish you each the very best from life. Here's to you, old DePauw. My field is evolutionary genetics, and I want to talk to you a little bit about evolutionary genetics and why it should make you feel good about your life, and then give you some practical advice. So evolutionary genetics, uh, has a lot to do with probability and the point i want to make is that you're enormously lucky to exist in fact you're so lucky to exist that the odds of you ever existing someone with the same genes as you ever existing again is vanishingly small essentially zero so you are the lucky outcome of the union of your dad's sperm and your mom's egg and that will never happen again and you were born now the second thing biologists know that contributes to the kinds of traits folks have is their environment. If you're watching this, you probably went to DePaul University and you were very lucky to be able to do that, to get an education, to live in a place where you can get food. Um, that doesn't happen to many people. And historically, 
folks worldwide have had to struggle just for an existence. So you're lucky on two accounts. You're lucky, you're lucky for the genes you have and you're lucky for the environment you're in. But you didn't control any one of those. That was just all luck. Good luck on your part. So the result of that is that you really don't control much of your life. But your environment and your genes do. But that means you have a lot of power because you are the environment of everybody else. So what you do with your life can actually make a huge difference in other people's life. So you do, there is great meaning to your life in the sense that you can have a huge effect just by your behavior. So I urge you to take advantage of your enormous good luck in just being alive at this place and this time and do something to make the world a better place. So my second bit of advice is more practical. I'm going to tell you how to make a really good summertime drink called a Negroni, N-E-G-R-O-N-I. It's a drink favored by Ernest Hemingway. It consists of three parts. Gin, good gin, if you want to do it well. Vermouth, sweet vermouth, preferably rosso. And third, an Italian liqueur from Milan called Campari. The traditional Negroni recipe consists of these three ingredients in equal proportions, but I find that a bit too bitter. So I prefer Stanley Tucci's variation on that recipe, which is two parts gin, one part rosso vermouth, and one part Campari. And then once you get all those mixed up in a glass, before you even put the rocks on there, find an orange and take the thinnest possible sliver off the rind of that orange. Don't get any of that white stuff, the pith underneath of it. Squeeze that, that uh, orange rind around the glass, put it in the glass, and if you really want to go daring, cut a slice of orange and squeeze that and drop it in the glass. Then add the rocks, stir it all up, and you'll have a fantastic summertime drink. So thanks for letting me have a chat with you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to have taught at the Paw. It's been a great existence, and I hope you have a life that's just been as good as mine. Peace out.